I guess in my 52 year railroad career, I have walked to the moon and back on railroad platforms just like this in the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And I've come to know there are a lot of untold stories and even a few secrets out there involving the railroad industry. Please join us and subscribe so we can continue to bring you those untold stories and even a few secrets from America's railroad past. All aboard! High ball it, Eagle! Have you heard the travel news about the Eagle Way? To your destination happening every day The Texas Eagle is clicking, clicking on the rail From the Windy City to the Alamo Meet you at the station, come on, let's go People get ready and catch the way Catch the way The Texas Eagle Way Hello again, ladies and gentlemen, and uh, welcome to my podcast, I've Seen Some Trains Before. Griff Hubbard here with you once again with a real treat. We have Mark S. Kane, former president of Amtrak Intercity, who's going to share his many behind-the-scenes stories of experience, strength, and hope about rail passenger service uh, in the United States and uh, on the route of the Texas Eagle uh, particularly. Welcome, Mr. Kane. Thank you for the honor and privilege of uh, you being here on this podcast. Well, thank you, Griff. I'm privileged. It's very much an honor for me to be part of this. I, I'm just so honored that you would ask me. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Kane and I uh, last saw each other 30 years ago when he took me to lunch, but uh, he, he and, and there's no reason why he should remember that. But I do when I, when I think I think you you're you were titularly, titularly vice president at that time. But when a vice president takes you to lunch, uh, you don't forget it. And, and I never have. So, uh, sir, from our association of 30 years, uh, comes today's full-term fruition of, uh, of uh, I've seen some trains before and how we got here. Tell us historically about your background. Where do you hail from? As we say in the South, where were you born and reared? All right. Well, I was uh, born in Little Falls, Minnesota, the same town that Charles Lindbergh was born in, but was sometime after he. And then I was raised in the uh, in the St. Paul, Minnesota area in a suburb of St. Paul called Invergrove Heights. That's where I went to high school, went to college at the University of St. Thomas in St. Paul, Minnesota, although at that time it was called College of St. Thomas. It was an all-male school at that time. And then the year I graduated, they went co-ed. Then I went from there to the University of Minnesota for uh, a graduate degree, a master's degree in business. All right. Um, what great credentials. And I have to ask this question. Did you know any of the Lindbergh family? But were there no. any Lindberghs left by the time uh, you came along? If there were, I wasn't aware of them. And, and um, I was born there, but not really raised there. Because at the time, my dad was in the military. So my mom was staying with her mother at the time when I was born. My dad was out in Virginia, based there. And then Churchill, Manitoba after that. So... When my dad got settled, then my mom and I moved with back to him. And then he got out of his active duty and resumed his career as a dining car cook on the Great Northern Railroad. Wow. Back in okay. St. Paul. Well, that kind of brings us to the beginning of your railroad heritage. I want to ask a question uh, first. Uh, since I've started this podcast in uh, on October 1 of this year, but I've had... Uh, put several, as they say, in the can, uh, may not have aired yet, but I've done uh, around a, a 10 or 12 of them. I have found out, and, and maybe, sir, it's because we're all uh, retired from our previous railroad jobs and have either moved into new railroad jobs or new endeavors, but I'm surprised at the number of people that have been willing to admit that they always wanted to go to work for the railroad from childhood. That it that it uh, while it may not have been the main focus, it was always burning in the back of their spirits. Were you one of those? Uh, I'd say not especially. I um, I was kind of like agnostic about it through college. Uh, by the time I became a senior in college, I I 
interviewed with Burlington Northern and they didn't have any jobs available for their management training program. I interviewed with other companies also, but the economy was bad. This was 1977 and companies in general weren't hiring very aggressively. And um, I was intrigued by Burlington Northern because I, all I saw was opportunity in the railroad industry. At that time, there were a lot of troubles with the demise of the Penn Central on the heels of that. The Rock Island was in trouble. Milwaukee Road was in trouble in, in that you know, geographic area. Uh, and you know people typically thought of railroads as being a dead industry. I did not perceive that at all. Uh, instead, I saw opportunity. So it wasn't an industry that I had exposure to. And I can tell you more about that in a little bit more from before I was even in college, the exposure. Uh, so I actually, I interviewed with Burlington Northern, like I said, when I was a senior in college, they didn't have anything. And the person that I talked to said, why don't you go get your master's degree and then talk to us? So I did. And that then led to me actually getting uh, two job offers, one to either go into corporate planning into a staff position or to go into operations as, as a manager trainee, as an assistant train master. And that was the route that I chose, but it was because I saw opportunity. Am I misremembering? Your grandfather was a railroader, correct? No, I have a great grandfather that was an engineer on the Milwaukee road. Okay. And then, but uh, then there was a skip generation. Then my dad was a cook on the Great Northern. Okay, uh, for for a career, I mean, was that his? Oh yeah, was he's a, a dining car man. So, yeah. so he was a cook on the real railroad legacy Great Northern Empire Builder. I'm sure. Oh, definitely. In his lifetime. In fact, yeah, and um, in 1965, I was only 10 years old. And he was out working on the coffee shop car of the ranch or the coffee shop car of the Western Star. And back then in the summertime, the trains were just jam packed and they had extra cars on the trains. They were totally jam packed. They'd have, you know, over 700, 800 people on the train and they'd be serving to 11 p.m. at night. And my dad was all alone as a cook in that car. He had one waiter. And he said to me, How would you like to go along with me to Seattle? And you can help me in the kitchen. Here I'm 10 years old. Sure. You know, things were different then, right? Right, and right. I said, well, sure, this would be a hoot to be able to do that. So I did. I actually worked when I was 10 years old in the coffee shop car, the Western Star in 1965 on one trip. So then the next year, 1966, I don't know if you recall or not, but there was a huge airline strike. I did. Northwest, United, some other major carriers went on strike. Well, in that neck of the woods, Northwest was dominant between Chicago and the Pacific Northwest. My dad was working on the ranch car, the Empire Builder, that summer as a chef on that. And he had one college student to help him out who was overwhelmed. And my dad said, hey, that worked out pretty good last summer. How would you like to do that again and go out and help? And I said, sure. Well, this time I went down to Chicago from St. Paul, St. Paul to Chicago, out to Seattle, then back to St. Paul. I did that five times that summer. I helped him on that ranch car. So uh, then you go to after the Burlington Northern merger, before Amtrak took over, my dad was working on the Main Street or on the uh, Traveler's Rest car, the Lewis and Clark Traveler's Rest car. He was all alone on that car too. And that summer he asked me if I'd want to go on a trip with him. So I did that. And then I got a chance to go on the Northern Pacific Territory. So... Yeah, my I had railroad experience before I got into college. And then, by the way, when I got into college, I was looking for a job that would help me get out of uh, college with as little debt as possible. I wanted to pay for my own education. My family couldn't afford to pay for my college. I was the first person from my family to go to college. And, uh, you know, if you if you have relatives that work in the industry, you can typically get connections. So I was right. able to be hired by Amtrak in 1973. And I uh, started out that summer, I worked all that summer as a dishwasher in the dining car on the Empire Builder. Then I did that again in, let's see, it was 1974 and then 75, they didn't hire back because of the economy. And then in 76, 
I went out. And then I was also working that summer as a coach porter and as a waiter, waiter in the dining car. So I had a lot of, you know, Burlington Northern, you know, former Great Northern uh, in my blood, so to speak. Well, so uh, you come by your passion for railroading, honestly, then. Uh, it sounds like your dad, your dad making career. I'll, I'll tell you a, a little, a very brief story about, if you'll remember the the Western style car, you called it something, ranch style, ranch car. Ranch car. That was kind of like the, you had two um, cars for eating on the Empire Builder. You had the dining car, full service dining car. And you had the ranch car, which had more like sandwiches and, uh, you know, fish and chips, that kind of stuff, but not the full course dining menu. The the story I wanted to tell you about the ranch car, I, I hope it survived. Who knows where it is now? But in that car, it actually had a registered cattle brand, the G bar N cattle brand. That's right. And that car was assigned to St. Louis to Laredo service with the inauguration of Amtrak service to Arkansas through East Texas to Dallas and, oh my and on to Laredo. And one day it set out at Texarkana with a hot box oh. and it, it was there about a week. And I want you to know the, the car, I, I was the agent at Texarkana in those oh. early years. And, and a car man came to me one night and he, he said, uh, you know, I've got some nut trying to steal this this G bar in. He said, what oh, value? No. And I said, don't ask. Just make sure the car is locked up because people will come and try to take. And and actually, some I, I don't think he was ever arrested, but actually somebody tried to take it off the wall and steal it while it was set out on the rip track at Texarkana. I for believe that week. I hope it survives. Uh, yeah, I hope. I hope that the. I know the. Car, does the car survive? It may. I don't know. I hope it's. If it, it did, and it's still there. Not many have. There aren't a lot Not. left. So, uh, okay, sir. So you're working. So I, I have to ask because he's mm -hmm. just been one of my more recent podcast guests, whose show is currently up and running. Uh, did you know Mike Dwyer at all? Because he was working out of the Minneapolis St. Paul crew base about these same years as you. I don't recall. I'm sorry, I don't. Okay. All right. Uh, if, if you get a chance, or you may have already done it, you might want to watch his podcast because he tells some overlapping stories about the about uh, that. That I'm sure you would know exactly what he was talking about. Okay. So, so you. Uh, so when the uh, when the Burlington Northern offered you after after you graduated with a master's degree and they offered mm -hmm. you a job, mm -hmm. uh, you could have even you could have either gone into the planning department or the operating department. And like any good railroad man, you chose operating. Good for you. I I, I hope I would have done the same thing. And uh, take it from there. What happened? Well, I chose operations because. Again, like I told you earlier, I believe all I saw in the industry was opportunity. And when I was talking to my classmates in graduate school, you know, we compare notes about who you're interviewing with and all that. And I interviewed with a number of different companies and I had other opportunities. I chose Burlington Northern and my classmates said, what are you nuts? You know, they're dying. They're, this is a oh. dead industry. Why would you do that? And like I said earlier, I said, all I saw was opportunity with them. I chose the operating route there because I really wanted to learn the business from the ground up. I certainly had some ground level exposure having run over the rail, you know, as much as I did back in the GN days and then working for Amtrak, but not like what you get when you have to be out there re-railing cars or efficiency testing or, uh, you know, switching cars and running locals and snow plows and, you know, you name it, work trains, uh, all that kind of stuff. Early. So uh, that was why I chose that route. I went through the management training program on the Twin Cities region, Minneapolis, St. Paul, Twin Cities region. And I was primarily assigned to the Minnesota division. And I got exposure to all the facets of the business uh, in doing that. Uh, I even had time with uh, sales in Chicago. Um, 
you know, all I spent time with sled gangs, tie gangs, steel gangs, uh, you know, in the diesel shop and the car shops, the whole nine yards as a management trainee. After that was completed in nine months, then I got transferred to Galesburg, Illinois as an assistant train master. Back then, Galesburg was the, the highest volume facility on the Burlington Northern System, and it was a double hump operation. You had an eastbound hump, you had a westbound hump. Wait, hi, highest volume of, of freight cars per diem? I mean, it, per okay, day, so per, per day humped, per process. Per day, per day hump. hump, got it, got it, got right. it. Yeah, because it, it was a, it's an intersection. Well, I, I I wouldn't have guessed that. Okay, it's Galesburg, Illinois, busiest right. busiest hump yard on the whole system. It was then. I'm not sure what it is now. Right. Uh, and well, when I was on the in a, in the training program, I worked at the Northtown Hump Yard, which was the most modern facility that the Burlington Northern had at the time. It was just a flagship, you know, computerized control hump operation. Everything. I get to Galesburg, and the East and West Hump were both built. Uh, you know, like 1940s or so. And all the, the tracks in the bowl were built for 40 foot long cars. Here we're handling 60 foot to 89 foot cars. You know, so we were ha we would have, you know, typically three to four derailments a shift. And the yard was just decrepit. Uh, all the money was being put into buildup of coal for Burlington Northern. You know, not much into to keeping that facility running. So it was a real experience. Uh, you know, I learned a lot in the one year that I was there. When I was, I mentioned that I worked at the Northtown Hump Yard as part of the training program. And I got exposed to a man by the name of Bill Greenwood. And he was the terminal superintendent there at the time. And uh, when I was with him, I was able to do some special projects like, you know, switch engine, uh, you know, redeployment study, uh, studies of damage in the hump yard, uh, personal injuries, studies, that kind of stuff. And he said to me, wow, you know, this has been a lot of fun having you help me out. Would you ever want to work with me again? And I said, yeah, for sure. So he got transferred to Alliance, Nebraska while I was at Galesburg. So I'm here, I'm in Galesburg for almost a year or so. And he calls up and he says, I have a spot for a train master out here. Would you be interested? Well, Alliance at that time was like the wild, wild west because Burlington Northern was building up its capacity to handle powder over basin coal. It had built, uh, just had completed a new line between, I'll call it Gillette and Orrin, Wyoming, 110 miles or so of, of new railroad. And the company was just investing oodles of money into coal, hair, coal carrying capacity. And so, Bill Greenwood got assigned there because the operations were being run so poorly. Uh, we were having to basically build up a whole railroad in order to handle this incredible volume of coal that was seen on the horizon. And we had to do it under load. In other words, we had to do it live. We could not shut the railroad down for any extended periods of time because we needed the cash that the coal trains generated to continue funding the company because the company was basically breaking even. And would you would you permit me just to make a brief historical aside here? Absolutely. At that particular time, sir, and you you having also lived in Texas part of your life, you may have already been aware of that. But a lot of that coal at that time was coming to the brand new coal-fired plants in Northwest Louisiana and East Texas. Yep. Swepco. So, yes, that's where that that's where that coal came. Also San Swepco. Antonio Elmendorf, uh Smithers Lake down by Houston. Oh, believe me, all those train symbols were emblazoned on me because my job was one a unique job in Alliance. I was one of four what we called control center train masters. And our job, but wasn't the typical train master job where you're really out, you know, managing the crews out online. We would do that like every, we were on a shift we worked for, oh, let's see, it was two straight weeks of 12 hour days. And then we would have a week off. And every fourth cycle, we would actually go out in the field and then relieve some train master out in the field. So we'd be doing typical train master stuff. But while we were in the control center, we were making sure that all the coal trains were running as close to ideal tender as possible, typically 110 cars, making sure that the maintenance away people were getting the amount of track time that they needed for the different jobs, prioritizing which jobs got done, uh, 
making sure the dispatching flows were going properly. It was the nerve center of the operation. So in Galesburg, I got like, you know, five years experience in one year because of just the nature of the way that that situation was. Uh, the mix of all the different types of trains, everything that BN handled went through there, including passenger trains. And then Alliance, I said it was like the Old West. Not only was it just incredibly busy and challenging business-wise, but the average age of, age of our train operating employees were like 21 to 22 years old. We were hiring kids right off the street and putting them through a rapid training program. And uh, before we got there, they you know, the, the, uh, the rule G policies were pretty loose there because they needed right. people so bad rule G is you can't have drugs or alcohol in your system to run the train right. in case somebody doesn't understand what that is. And the crew callers before, uh, Bill Greenwood and, and I got out there, you know, they would go to the bar to call crews. They were so desperate to get people to fill out the crews. So it was the wild west. It really was it like, Ladies and gentlemen, as, as a very brief aside, for those of you who are not railroaders, uh, Mr. Kane is speaking about a time in the industry where drug and alcohol abuse, uh, while not tolerated, uh, was certainly uh, overlooked if a warm body was needed. And I just want to uh, assure our guests that today in the 21st century, I'm happy to report that is not the case. There is a zero tolerance level for you. You and I both both came up in a time. I I saw many people uh, suspended for drinking or drugging on the railroad, but I never saw anybody lose their job because they needed the manpower. You and know, that but, changed. That changed in like the the mid to late nineteen eighties. I was in Alliance. See, that would be about nineteen eighty. 81 or so. And already we were turning the page there because uh, Bill Greenwood, to his credit, he put in a zero tolerance policy. He says, you know what, we can't have this because we had some collisions out there that were affected by alcohol abuse, like Angora, Nebraska, before I got there, three or four people lost their lives in that collision. It was a head-on collision. And it was because of, of drug and alcohol abuse. So a zero tolerance policy went in right there. Well, that that was certainly a cutting edge before its time. So, but it was so overdue. It was yes. so overdue. Yeah. Yes, sir. I, I have a question, please, about the management trainee program. Sure. You know, I'm not sure that this is factually true, but anecdotally, I think it's interesting that Downing B. Jinks the third, who was president and later chairman of the Missouri Pacific Railroad. Yep. At least at least from my standpoint, anecdotally took credit for having developed the management trainee program, which became the prototype across the industry. I'm I'm not sure that's factually true, but anecdotally, that's what we were always told. But I but if it is accurate, I think it's it's interesting. You know, the the 1948 streamlined Empire Builder, whose cars lasted in operation well into the Amtrak era, you know, one of its round in observation cars was the Cyrus O. Jinx. Mm. And, and that had been James J. Hill, the empire builders, uh, right-hand man, a uh, Cyrus <laughs> O. Jinx. And that was Mr. Jinx grandfather. So, so there was a, there's a lineage there. And, and I just wondered uh, had you ever heard that that the management trainee program had originated on the Missouri Pacific? No, I knew that the Great Northern had the longest lived one for all of the Burlington Northern predecessor roads. It was renowned for their management training program. And they took pride in the fact that regardless of the way the economic cycles were going, they still maintain their management training program. And that started, I believe, clearly in the 1950s. It may have been before that. And then they would send people to Harvard for continuing education, those kinds yes. of things too. But the Missouri Pacific program was very well known. And one of my coworkers at Burlington Northern came out of that, Matt Rose. And then he, after the merger, being Santa Fe merger, he ended up being the CEO of Burlington Northern Santa Fe and did a phenomenal job. 
Let me, I, I have never heard that story before. Let me just make sure that I understood it correctly. Mm -hmm. Matt Rose was a graduate of the Missouri Pacific Railroad Management Trainee Program. Yeah. And I he, did not know that. He did that. And he left there and went into the trucking industry. He left the Missouri Pacific, went to work for North American Van Lines, if I remember right. And then Norfolk Southern bought them, but he still was on the trucking side when we hired him to uh into our automotive unit in around 1994 or so in order to run our auto stack program which was containerization of automobiles in double stack cars got it so so your participation in the burlington northern management trainee program was how many years nine months. how long oh nine months okay yeah nine months yeah. And in that particular time, you got exposure to all different departments across the Twin Cities region and especially the Minnesota division. Right. OK. All right. And so uh, now you have come through. Uh, you, you Now you've taken a job with Mr. Greenwood. Right. In Alliance, at, Nebraska. At, at, that's at Alliance, which, Nebraska. Yeah. And, and, what, and training. take take the story up. OK. So after the manager training program, then assistant train master Galesburg, then train master out in Alliance. So I've been out in Alliance now for about a year. And then Bill Greenwood pulls me aside and he says, hey, they're talking to me about taking over this new intermodal business unit. And this was at the time of deregulation. Okay, the Staggers Act right. is passed. Right. Burlington Northern hires a consulting firm and they recommend that Burlington Northern respond to this deregulation by getting closer to the customer uh, in its commercial relationships and its operating relationships and act more like having businesses within the business. So it established a business unit structure and there were uh, five strategic business units of which Intermodal was one. And for Intermodal, they asked Bill Greenwood if he would be interested in taking over leadership of that as uh, the title then was Senior Assistant Vice President of Intermodal. So I'm in alliance with Bill and he says, they're talking to me about this. What do you think of it? And I said, as far as I'm concerned, that's the future of railroading. You know, this is where it's at. Unfortunately, it was one of the lowest profit businesses that the company had. So it was a case of where, you know, I knew that if this was going to be a, a viable business, the future would have to be totally restructured. You have to have a total different business approach and all that. You know, so I have all this going through my mind. So he said, okay, well, would you like to join my staff in St. Paul? He says, I can put you on my staff in a planning position. And I said, well, yeah, sure. Because, you know, Alliance wasn't the end of the world on the railroad, but you could see it <laughs> from there. You could see I understand. it. And here I'm a single guy out in Alliance. And I'm, you know, my life was railroad, eat, sleep, railroad, eat, sleep. That was yes, it. Sir. So, you know, it was like I got another five years of experience in one year in Alliance. So I thought, wow, what an intriguing opportunity. Plus, I can go back to some civilization, go back to St. Paul, my, you know, my home territory uh, and have an opportunity to do this intermodal thing. So I said to, to Bill, yeah, I'd be interested. So, geez, we spent, you know, a couple of evenings at his house on Box Butte Avenue in Alliance, Nebraska, brainstorming about what we would do with this intermodal business. And we came up with. Uh, two of our three major strategies there about hub centers, moving from ramps to hubs and, and dedicated intermodal trains to run between those hubs. We we spawned those ideas right there. So then I, he got the job. I moved to St. Paul and I took a job as manager of intermodal planning and then uh, shifted from that to intermodal marketing. Then we moved from St. Paul to Fort Worth, Texas. The headquarters of Burlington Northern was moved to Fort Worth and so made the move there. What, became, what year was that, Mr. Kane? 1984. 84, okay. Yep. And then became director of intermodal marketing. And um, well, I tell this story in a book that I've written uh, called Against All Odds. It's a story about BN's intermodal business and really a story about the history of the Burlington Northern Railroad itself. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more details about all this stuff in there, including you know, BN's history around all this. So then after uh, I was director of marketing, we started to get into the uh, domestic containerization program. And then I moved over to marketing resources, which is a business 
a support uh, group for the marketing department to help with all the support functions for marketing, everything from human resources to tariffs to uh, uh, you know car cleaning to reload facilities to you know you name it, all these support things for marketing. Then when uh, Hunter Harrison moved on to the Illinois Central to be the uh, president of IC, he had been the vice president of service design in Overland Park. And then they asked me to take his job as vice president of service design in Overland Park. So I moved from Fort Worth to Overland Park. Then um, we st started to like restructure what we were doing in BN operations wise, change the way we do business. And then I became vice president of equipment management. And that was to manage all of the equipment on the whole railroad. Uh, that would be, you know, your freight equipment did not manage locomotives, did not manage, you know, things like uh, tampers or anything like that for maintenance away, but all of the, the other rolling stock uh, man, how, how about the Chicago commuter trains? Did you manage them? No, no. The, those were run by Metra. Burlington Northern only operated them at the time. They had turned those over to Metra, the okay, Chicago, by this Chicago time. Regional Transit Authority. Got it. Right. So I was VP of equipment management and frankly, having the time of my life was best job I ever had because there was so much opportunity in managing like, you know, $4 billion worth of rolling assets or whatever it was, it was, they're worth a lot, you know, all the cars, you know, sizable, you know, multi hundred million dollar budget. And freight car management was something that just, it wasn't kind of like a mainstream thing for railroads. You manage trains, you know, that was the sexy thing to manage trains. And, you know, from our intermodal experience, we knew you had to manage the cars to get the profitability improve, work on the asset velocity and, you know, make sure you, you, you know, you're sizing your fleet properly. You're matching up to customer demand properly and everything. So I was working that job and our intermodal unit, which I was not a part of, except I was, uh, my team was running the equipment for intermodal. It was floundering. It was generating a negative return on assets and a decision was made to replace the, or actually they broke the unit up. Uh, it had been an integrated business unit. They broke it up. Uh, part of it was in the equipment area. Then a decision was made to pull it back together again under new leadership. And then Bill Green would ask me if I would take over leadership of intermodal. And I said, yeah, under one condition. And that's that it get reinstituted as an integrated business unit with hub operations, equipment, marketing, all aspects of marketing and sales, all that together. And he said, you got it. So then I, I did that. And that was now we're down to 1992, around September of 92 or so. And uh, then I was that uh, VP of intermodal marketing until the BN Santa Fe merger. And the BN Santa Fe merger was actually, which is also laid out in that book I told you about. Um, it, it was really spawned by our intermodal business plan that, we needed to have our franchise improved because we were the, had the worst intermodal franchise of all the major class one carriers in the business. Uh, just did not serve major population centers. Oh, Other okay. than Pacific Northwest Chicago, we were sucking wind really competitively, even though we were doing remarkable things. And we turned the business around uh, totally financially uh, when I was back in it. It's, it's a wonderful story. And against all odds story because there are a lot of internal and external impediments to our successes and that led to the I, merger i i want to ask a question i want to thank you for saying that when when you manage the uh fleet equipment that you never had more fun in your life thank you thank you for saying that and i, I want to ask a question mm -hmm. uh as, as you and i had visited previously you know for the last 19 and a half years of my Amtrak career, I was the senior revenue manager for the Texas Eagle all the way from Chicago to LA, determined the number of cars, the number of seats, how many rooms to sell, what price to sell. I never had more fun, thank you, in my entire life those 19 years. And, and I want to know if it's for the same reason. Even though you were freight cars and I was passenger cars, I'll tell you what I had the most fun in. At the end of the month, 
what I did was immediately quantifiable. Oh, sure. You you knew you knew immediately if you were on the right track or the wrong track. Definitely. And and I love that part of it. Yeah. And, and it and it was the same way in the freight part of it too. You oh, knew. definitely. Yeah. You got better immediate feedback. And another thing too is that, you know, when you're when you're a, you know, a traditional operating officer, like say you're a division superintendent, uh, if that Amtrak train's late, they're all over your rear end. If the UPS train is late, they're all over your rear end. You have there's that kind of a you know microscopic visibility into everything that you do, and there are tons of second guessers. In the equipment area, it wasn't that way because it was an area that was kind of ignored. So you could you could just say, okay, I know that this is the right thing to do, and you know you have I put together equipment teams managing different car types. C6 jumbo covered hoppers for grain fertilizer or wood chip cars or gondolas, you know, special box cars, uh, conventional box cars, you know, whatever by team. We had just where these teams manage everything soup to nuts for that car, everything from long term strategic planning for that car, right on down to where the car should be cleaned to where should they be? How, how are we going to fill the car orders, you know, day by day? So, totally. It, it was fully integrated. And I don't think anybody else in the rail industry was doing it at the time. I'm not sure what they do now, but doing that just revealed so many opportunities to do things better, more effectively. And, um, and nobody bothered us. That was a cool thing. What We would get attention during grain harvest season if the car orders weren't getting filled because then you know the public utilities commissions for North Dakota and Montana would be all over our butt and our grain people right. would be you know, very upset. But typically, you know, as long as we did our job and kept those corridors filled and didn't have to deal with those, you know, problems with trying to accommodate the Easter crowd for a church that's built for a regular Sunday, uh, you know, it, it was pretty, you know, it was fun, just fun. I, I, you, you, you've made a statement that I cannot let lie because of my background. I have to know the details here. You said, and if Amtrak were getting delayed, they would be on your rear end. Okay. Yeah. Number one, who are they and define on your rear end? Who who are they and what did they do? They would be like your uh, executive vice president of operations. Oh, wow. um, definitely your Amtrak liaison, you know, would be very concerned. Um, but it, you know, Amtrak's a first class train. It's in the timetable. You know, it's very, very visible. And if you don't run the Amtrak train on time, you know that you've you've you know disappointed how many customers, you know, every individual on that train has their life negatively impacted by that. We were sensitive to that, very sensitive to that. Oh, let me um, let me let me quickly say, sir, I'm not at all convinced that other railroad companies shared your concern and thank you for that concern well so so I have what, to, what go ahead go ahead please all right i'm going to condition that because that concern was there but also i'll be honest on on bn when i was there amtrak was kind of a hated commodity the train right. got in the way it right. got no, in the way I understand of the that. trains, it got in the way of the grain trains, got in the way of the coal trains, got in the way of everything. And you had to set aside your operation to run Amtrak. But you did. You had to. But you did. Well, you didn't have a choice. I, I, again, I'm, I'm not so sure other railroad <laughs> companies shared your level of expertise on that. But OK, let's just let's just choose the executive vice president of operations. High up man. Mm -hmm. What did he do to step on your rear end? What what did that part? Did, did he pick up the phone and chew you out? Did he come down to your office? Did he? Oh, you'd have a morning meeting, you know, and right. you're going over the performance. What's you know right. what's going on? How are these trains okay. doing? You know, how are number five and six doing between Chicago and Denver? How are seven and eight doing? In you know twenty seven twenty eight between Chicago and Pacific Northwest. Um, there typically wasn't as much attention focused on like the Illinois trains because those trains just ran on time. There weren't, you didn't typically have the weather problems. You didn't have the flooding problems. You, you know, I mean, we would have horrible blizzards. What, you know, when it gets down to 30 below zero and the wind chill is 65 below zero, 
you yeah. can't run the trains on time. You have broken rails because right. of pull aparts, because the contraction of the rail. You have, uh, you know, in North Dakota, you get 25, 30 foot snow drifts when there's a blizzard. Right. Same, you know, even in Nebraska, that can happen. So, you know, you're sensitive to that. You know, we, it, I guess it's not much different than what it was back in the 1960s and 1950s with the senior operating officer getting on, you know, the rear ends of those operating people lower in the organization. If those trains didn't run on time, if the passenger trains didn't run on time, they're the high visibility trains. Right. Just like UPS. It was the same thing with UPS trains. Right. I, I, I just want to underscore, uh, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And thank Burlington Northern for carrying that operating message into the next decades and indeed into the 21st century. I, I, for those of you who are railroaders, and I know most of you who watch this podcast are, it is no secret that the uh, uh, Burlington Northern Santa Fe has a record uh, generally far superior to most other carriers in operating the passenger trains on time. And, and that's to be commended. And, and I think you just struck upon that legacy foundation of where that came from. So, well, the, so the know, roots of precision scheduled railroading actually started in, in the modern era at Burlington Northern with what Hunter Harrison was doing in service design, where he was focusing on trying to get a totally scheduled operation where not just trains were scheduled, but individual cars were scheduled. And, you know, I'm very sensitive to that because I picked up on that after Hunter left. You know, I picked up the baton from him. And what you see today in you know, with precision scheduled railroading, that really started there. But the, the whole principle has gotten corrupted since then. It was never envisioned to be something where you run 12,000 foot trains and call that precision scheduled railroading. Say that, say, say that one more time because you're going to answer my question. Uh, thank you for your honesty. And that's that's my question. Why does everybody, to a man or woman that I encounter, hate precision railroading today? It's because it was never envisioned to become, and please take that up. It, it was it never, never intended was to become a strategy of run for tonnage because okay. we had that strategy where when times would get bad and you're uh, you know, you're you're being pressured to cut your costs, cut down on train starts and all that. You would hold for tonnage. You would hold trains until you get enough cars to get a large train and run that. And you would not run on schedule. You would hold for tonnage. And the whole principle that we did an intermodal, even before Hunter Harrison became vice president of transportation, was we wanted to run a precision railroad running on time intermodal trains between hub centers, because we knew that that would be the most efficient and effective way of doing things. When we started the expediter trains, which I don't know if you remember or not, were the short trains. Could, could you, could you tell our viewers what the, I, I know, but could you tell the ex, our viewers what the expediter trains meant? Sure. Expediter trains, their genesis was on the former Springfield region, which was the old Frisco railroad. And this was around 1985. And I tell all the details in the book that I alluded to before, but Burlington Northern had just suffered with the Union Pacific entering the Powder River Basin. And they were starting to take a lot of our coal business. That put a major financial hickey on Burlington Northern, right? Mm -hmm. And the economy was going through another down cycle. We were losing more and more boxcar business to truckers. We didn't have a strong intermodal product to address that. So, we talked with our, our operations people and our labor relations people from Intermodal, and we said, you know, look, we have this whole Frisco division, this whole, or the Springfield division, former Frisco Railroad. When you could, most of the time, you could take a cannon on the railroad main line and shoot the cannon off and not hit anything, right? All kinds of excess capacity. We had locomotives in storage. We had crew people that were laid off. Unfortunately, we had labor rules down there on the Springfield division, Springfield region, I mean, where we had to have five to six em operating employees per train. It was crazy, you know, including a fireman a lot of times to get up to six right. people. Well, we could not afford to compete in intermodal 
in that kind of a marketplace for markets between Kansas City, Memphis, St. Louis, Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, those kinds of markets. So we talked to operations and said, you know, it would be great if we could, you know, fill this capacity up. We talked to our labor relations people and said, how about if we were to talk to the labor organizations about trying to get special crew agreements to run short, you know, shorter trains on tight schedules like you'd run Amtrak. I mean, these are these are gospel. These schedules are gospel. OK. And um, start with nothing, really, no business, because we didn't have anything to sell. Right. Make a commitment to the marketplace that we will we will institute these trains and we're going to run them between St. Louis and Dallas Fort Worth Houston between uh Birmingham and Kansas City you know uh that X there and those markets in between and and we'll do that so we got special labor agreements to do that and we were able to price that business just with you know marginal costing because there were a lot of assets that were just sitting around being underutilized to try to draw cash to the bottom line. And that's what the expediters were. So, so thank you. Thank you. Uh, so, so precision railroading of 2023 has morphed into something it was never intended to be. Is that a, is that a correct statement? I'd say so. It, 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 it that's not the vision that we had for it. Well, that, um, that's what I meant that, and well, but you helped to invent it, did you not? Weren't you a part uh, of the yeah, but I formula? Say you, you take that invent. If you take a look at how the freight railroads ran their business in the 1940s and 1950s, there was a lot of this that existed back then. Yes. Take a look. You know, I've studied the old Chicago, Burlington and Quincy passenger train operations. They had a pretty sophisticated network and they ran it like a clock. Um, before Bill Greenwood died, and he just died in September, I was talking to him about the locomotive rotations that the old CB and Q had for the for their passenger trains, and he was just saying to me, "Yeah, you you know this train, their locomotives went from Chicago to Denver. Then they went from those locomotives went from Denver to Billings. Then they went from Billings down to Houston. Then they went from Houston back to Denver. Then they went from Denver back to Chicago and all that. And you worked out that whole cycle. The locomotives hardly ever sat idle except when they had to get to their 30 day FRA maintenance cycle. You know, they had it all planned out. As an industry, we lost that sense of precision execution. We lost it, right. but we hadn't forgotten it. You know, some of us that studied the industry, you know, Bill Greenwood was a great example. Said, so, you know, it it doesn't have to be a slop operation. It can be right. a precision operation for everything, especially when you get to the level of scheduling that car. Every car should have a schedule. That's what the customer cares about. And that's that is your view of of how Precision Railroad got its genesis is in right. that thought process. Yeah, Burlington Northern right. Service Design process was the I'll call it the reincarnation of it, because by then you had the information system support, at least the beginnings of the information system support, to really be able to do that effectively to measure cars, whereas you really couldn't effectively before that. It was just too much with paper systems. You can measure train schedules, but not cars. Right. You know, you know, in in my very humble and respectful opinion, you know what you just said. You became you and your railroad career, sir, became part of that new generation who did not try to fix things that were not broken. Which I think so many times we're we're prone to do, just as human beings. I think you know? there's a lot to say for that. I think there's a lot to say for it was part of a generation that looked at just using common sense. Yes. A lot of it is yes. just frankly common sense. A generation also, at least in, I can speak for our intermodal people, where there was no bad idea. All right. Come up with the ideas. Whether right. they're actually workable is another issue. We'll figure that out. But meanwhile, keep it coming. And that's why we, we use the motto, innovative intermodal service. And, you know, it wasn't, uh, you know, creative intermodal service. You can be creative and not get anything done. Innovation is where you apply it. And that was our mantra. 
innovative intermodal service. You know, there was no bad idea. We had vendors coming into us from everywhere about all these different new equipment ideas and everything. We said, we'll take them all on. We want to try them all. We're going to try them all, you know, and we'll pick the best and everything. And you see in big businesses, they there's almost like a pride that sets in where I know better. Nobody can tell me anything. You can't teach me anything, you know, and I've seen that so many times, which is that you know, that's that's a terminal illness if if you take that attitude. And, and I hope I, that you know Griff, what you know, I don't mean to jump ahead here, but I hope you saw that when we were in Amtrak Inner City together, that's what we were doing. We were saying, let's get the ideas flowing here. We're in a dire straits, which we'll get to later. But all hands on deck, folks, you know, it doesn't matter what your title is, you have a good idea, let's do it. You know, that kind of a thing. I, I do remember that, which which is a nice segue here. Okay, it's 1992, and you're with the Burlington Northern at Fort Worth. Right. And I just and got the intermodal job. Just got the intermodal job. In 1992. Okay. How, so, so even though it had not occurred yet, your transition to Amtrak had to be on the horizon in there somewhere. It wasn't anywhere on the radar screen, even at the day I, the day I left Burlington Northern. I left Burlington Northern um, in June of 1995 because um, I had worked very hard on making that merger happen. And Jerry Grinstein, even who was the CEO, chairman and CEO of the railroad, he even gave me a letter that said, this is the Kane merger uh, because it was wow. such a- Wow. I hope you still have that letter. What a what a yeah, it's actually it's it's in my book. <laughs> oh, okay, good. We're we're gonna we're gonna see it a little bit. Yeah, okay. Good. Yeah. Okay. So um, he wrote it hit you. It was the Kane merger. Wow. That's, that's what he said. In the South, sir, we say that's high cotton. Yeah, maybe. I don't know how many letters he sent like that to other people. I <laughs> I'm not aware of any, but he may I have. Said, as we as we talked yesterday, I suspect that letter is like Mayor Audrey Carroll of Marshall having a an Amtrak pass that is valid as a board member of the board of directors for her lifetime. And she said to me, I just thought everybody got one of those. And I said, no, no, ma'am. And I suspect that letter is the same thing. I, I'll bet you only you got one of those. Well, perhaps. Um, so anyway, the so, merger gets right, so to I was you on left. the merger committee. Okay. I'm on the merger committee. The um the merger is not approved yet, but the Union Pacific pulls out of a hostile fight for control of the Santa Fe. Burlington Northern wins. Yeah, for, that. Could, could I could I just stop for just yeah. for the sake of our viewers who are non-railroaders? Sure. The merger, the Kane merger, is a proposed merger between Burlington Northern and Santa Fe. Got the it. Santa Fe Railroad had the premium intermodal corridor in the entire industry between Chicago and Los Angeles. That's the route that the Amtrak chief runs on. Right? I mean, now it's not the entire same route, but that's basically the route. Okay. The shortest time. Um, they you know run the highest speed, 70 mile an hour freight operations. Back then there was uh quite a bit of of uh two main lines not complete. They filled that out pretty much now, even a lot of triple track and everything. But that was, you know, the, you know, the, the prize of the industry, you know, it's like, if you have the ability to run that, if you, you've inherited, you know, you're a member of the lucky gene club, you know, to have inherited that. Right. So we needed that to fill out our franchise um, because we serve the Pacific Northwest all the way to the Southeast. Pacific Northwest of Chicago, but the the big opportunity was California, and we didn't have it. And to be able to link what we had between Birmingham and Avard, Oklahoma, for a joint service with the Santa Fe from Avard to California for that whole Sun Belt corridor, you know, the whole Sun Belt line. So that was the vision of the merger, which is also all laid out in great detail in this book that I've alluded to. Uh, so the the Union Pacific pulls out of the they they wanted to break that up. The Union Pacific wanted to buy Santa Fe instead of Burlington Northern. We knew that wouldn't fly with the Surface Transportation Board. 
uh, actually it was ICC at that time. Right. And the um, UP ended up pulling out of the battle and that's all detailed in that book too. So um, it was going to be clear that the Santa Fe people were going to be the ones that would be controlling what happened in Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Just like what happened with the Frisco in many respects, they took over Burlington Northern in the operating area. It, the handwriting was on the wall, especially in intermodal, that the Santa Fe would be taking over because they were considered the intermodal railroad, regardless of you know what we had done innovation-wise and everything like that. So we had a uh, change of control agreements as senior executives at Burlington Northern, which meant that if there was a, a change in control of the company, if there was a merger or an acquisition, then you would get a golden parachute. And I was at a point in my career where I thought, you know what, I could probably do other things here, but there was a reputation in the industry that the Santa Fe was more of a command and control railroad. Burlington Road was more collaborative. Okay. It wasn't like, you know, what do you think we ought to do? It was more, okay, I'm, I'm not only telling you to do this, but I'm telling you to do it in this color, that kind of a thing. I don't work well in that environment. And I was too young. I was only, let's see, that was like 39 years old, 40 years, well, four, yeah, 40 years old or so. I had all kinds of opportunities ahead of me, I figured. So if I were going to make a break in my career to move on to something else, even outside the railroad industry, that would be a good time to do it because I would have that golden parachute to fall back on as a bridge to something else and try something differently. So I left Burlington Northern very amicable terms um shoot july first, of 95 is that june, june of 95 june, june 1st of 95, 95. Okay. although i stayed on the payroll until about july 1st because of accrued vacation stuff like that but i took a cruise i i booked a cruise for my family to go to alaska an alaskan cruise and because i had three young daughters and um i had really in my career you know, i was working 10, 12 hour days, seven days a week. That's just the way I was wired coming out of operations. It was like that all the way through my time with even equipment management, intermodal marketing resources, whatever. And, you know, I never had a full vacation with my family. I always get called back. Well, you know how it is, Griff. That's just the way it is in the railroad business. That is so I said, you know what? We're going to get off the grid. My wife and I talked about it. We booked this cruise to Alaska. From the Anchorage, Alaska, though, I'm calling back because I needed some stuff for the merger uh, proceedings, you know, so right. I was doing that. So right. then um, I wasn't really sure what I was going to do. I put a lot of feelers out and a headhunter contacted me who was representing Amtrak about this Amtrak intercity opportunity. And I thought, oh, I don't know. You know, the 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 publicity about Amtrak was just not good at that time. It had just gone through a major rut restructuring in 1995, which you are intimately familiar with, right. reduction in frequencies on trains. And I remember back when I was at BN, I was observing that because, you know, part of my heart was still with Amtrak. I have Amtrak, had Amtrak roots. And I thought, oh my gosh, you know, but for the grace of God, there go I. Oh, I'm glad I'm not doing that. Right, right. sure, sure. So, I understand. but then- um, the headhunter contacted me and we talked and I thought, oh, I'm not sure I'd want to do this. The pay level was not market competitive. It was right. significantly below uh, competitive market rates. But I talked to my wife about it because I was encouraged to go and talk to Tom Downs for an interview. Sorry about Tom, that. That's OK. Tom Downs being the president of Tom, Amtrak at that time. He was the yeah. chief executive officer, president and chief executive officer of Amtrak. So the headhunter encouraged me to talk to him because I had this uh, Amtrak background. I had the intermodal background. I had the mail and express background. We had turned around the intermodal business unit from a negative return on assets to a return exceeding its cost of capital. That's all laid out in the book. Turned around the whole equipment process at Burlington Northern. Uh, and I had involved in a number of turnaround things within BN, special projects and everything. So I thought, well, it wouldn't be, I mean, why should, why keep a door closed? It's worth looking to the other side. There's no commitment. So I met with Tom Downs and we talked. Did you and, did you fly to Washington? And yeah, and is yeah, that where they, you okay? Yeah, they flew me out to Washington. So 
I had a meal. Were, were we still at Were we still at Lafont Plaza, or we were at Union Station by Union then? Union Station. Okay. Yeah, Union Station. So I met with him, and he was talking to me about this Amtrak Inner City, and I mean, you know, honestly, Griff, after coming out of BN, you know, it was a proverbial train wreck. The the amount of money being lost was just mind boggling. And, you know, he was saying to me that the Congress had a mandate on Amtrak. You had to be free of operating subsidy by, subsidy by the year 2000. And this is late 1995 now. So by the year 2000, you have to be free of operating subsidy. In a passenger railroad, there's no passenger railroad in the world that makes money. How right. do you do that? Right? right. So we're talking, we're sitting there talking. And I said, well, you know, I've done some research on you, and I know that in your charter, you have the ability to carry mail and express. And I said, when I was at BN, I can tell you, I would always look with envy at those Amtrak trains and think there's a lot of excess capacity on those trains. These trains have premium slots. Why can't there be some mail and express on those trains, such as there was before Amtrak took over, before the passenger railroads you know, basically lost the mail contract back in 19, 1967. Right. You know, th there was still s expressed some carried after that. But before that, so many of the passenger trains were subsidized by mail and express. So I said that I know that there's a significant opportunity that the railroads are not capturing. And I think that Amtrak could capture that. And I said, to me, the only way that you ever have a hope of being able to operate without an operating subsidy is if you have mail and express subsidizing the passenger losses. And I said, it would not be pretty. It would be difficult logistically to handle uh, all kinds of challenges, but I see that as being your only hope. And he said, honestly, I think you're right, but we don't know how to do it. You know, we're just not wired for that. And so he's, he, it got to the point where then he offered me a job and, you know, again, that was compensation wise, not attractive compared to what the other opportunities were. But I talked to my wife about it and I said, you know, God's been really, really good to us. You know, shoot here, I was 40 years old and I had accomplished so many things at BN. Um, we were secure financially, not ultra wealthy at all. I was just hitting what would be the peak earning years of my life. But I said, maybe what God is saying is that this is a time to try to give back more. You know, being willing to take something for not, something significantly below market, but that's okay. If you can create a greater common good, that's okay. And Amtrak wasn't offering me something where I need to have food stamps. I'm not saying that at all. Uh, but it would be for the common good. Is it is it okay to say? Here's what I hear you saying, but I don't want to misspeak. I mm -hmm. hear you saying the remarkable the remarkable frankness, which uh, I just think is wonderful. That spirituality was a part of your decision to go to Amtrak. Spirituality has been, oh, you know, the heart of every decision I made. Okay. Yeah. You know, oh my gosh. Yeah. You know. I mean, the blessings that I received. You know. You know. There's a. a I talk about it in that book I referred to earlier, but there is a practice that my wife and I adopted back in the 1980s that when I was over in the Far East, uh, one of our customers from Evergreen Marine, what actually was a customer we were trying to recruit, uh, the president of Evergreen Marine commented on it because we, we fast a couple of days a week just on bread and okay. water. Okay. And uh, it's a spirituality based practice. And, you know, this, this man said, well, you know, why aren't you eating? You know, don't you like, don't you feel good? Doesn't the food any good? And I told him, well, no, this is just a, you know, I don't eat. And he says, may I ask you why? And I told him why. And he says, oh my gosh, I, I can't believe you do that. I mean, I, I respect that so much. You know, he says, you know, in our, in our um, Hindu culture, that is very much respected. I says, well, you know, I, I respect that also. And uh, I said to him, one of the main reasons I do this is because to keep me rooted that, you know, God's been very good to me here. I've accomplished so many great, wonderful things in my life. It's all because of the grace of God. And I have to remember that, you know, 
just, you know, I am destined to dust, I will return. Okay, don't get a big head. You know, keep your head where it needs to be. And remember that it's God's grace that has gotten you where you are. So that that's, you know, part of it. Sir, it's, uh, it's just my humble and personal opinion, but I have met my share of, of railroad higher level executives who have not reached your level of nirvana. So <laughs> I, I, I bow to you with great respect and, and appreciate that story very, very much. So, so uh, you viewed, using your words here, uh, which I just also think is remarkable, you viewed your employment with Amtrak as perhaps an opportunity to give back through the grace of God. I, here's a chance. Not perhaps as an opportunity. It was. Okay. Right. okay. Because I had experiences that Tom Downs said to me, it, they don't exist within Amtrak. He said, you have gone through things that, you know, you face challenges that we face, but we don't have the people within Amtrak to, to get us to where we need to go. And we both knew that, for example, Mail and Express was a long shot. It was going to be a very, very tough thing to do. And that also the passenger service had to be premium. You know, that had to be the number one. You wouldn't become a mail and express carrier with a passenger sideline. It's a passenger railroad with a mail and express sideline that enables you to be able to fulfill your mandate of being a national carrier, a national passenger service. But Congress was saying, you, you know, you know, you're going to get cut off, right? Just bluntly. And we can talk about that in a lot more, you know, in a little bit when I talk about what happened when I got to Amtrak. So, so when did you, at, what what was your first day on the job at, at, in, in corporate headquarters? If, if that's indeed where you started, I presume. Well, no, I, my office was in Chicago. My, okay. that was my office, but my first day on the job wasn't in Chicago. It was actually at an Amtrak, um, conference it was a national marketing conference that was in what maryland i think i don't know i have it in my notes somewhere but they had all the sales people and the marketing people at amtrak in for this thing and this and was in 1995 1996 february 1st february 1st of 96 okay yeah all oh right. it took a while for amtrak to vet me I was That's never okay. Please. vetted oh, yeah. or for any job than what this was. And I'll tell you what, as I was going through it, I was having second thoughts thinking, is this worth it? I mean, what they were doing to me was remarkable. I had to, they were, they interviewed probably, I had to come up with all kinds of names of people um, to, for them to talk to, including people that I thought would give me a bad review. And I said, sure, I'll give you names. I don't care. You know, yeah. that's fine with me. People, you know, labor leaders, uh, you know, former local chairman that I had worked with, uh, you know, you name it, competitors, everything. And, you know, I got a copy of that. Tom Downs gave me a copy of all these interview notes of all these interviews that were these different people. Now, like, Holy crap. So, now, when you, <laughs> you met with Tom Downs in person in, in 1995. Oh, yeah. Started like You're in November. In November, but it's February of ninety six. Okay, boy, that's... Amtrak did not do things very rapidly. Wow. Okay. No, because you know you had a very I'll, I'll be honest, a dysfunctional board, a bunch of political appointees that weren't business people, and so much was focused on. Okay, is this politically acceptable? Is that politically acceptable? And you know, here I'm a young guy who's fairly brash. Not, I don't think I was brash from the standpoint of being egotistic or anything like that, but brash in terms of trying new things that, you know, okay, if it's not invented here, it doesn't matter. Let's try it. You know, that kind of a stuff. Right. So I wasn't out of the typical mold. And plus, you know, I looked way younger than I yeah. was. Uh, yeah, I'm told yeah. I still do, but back then, you, you know, I, I was 40 years old. I looked like I was 20. I was still getting carded in bars. You did. You know? Yeah. Yeah. So that created so, an issue. Okay, so so it's not until February that you're tendered a job offer. 
Th no, that was when I started. I was tendered the job okay. offer. Um, it was over the Christmas break, but it took them that long from the time that I was tendered the job offer. And then like, I don't know, it's probably at the end of the first week of January, I accepted or whatever. And then it took them that long before they said, okay, here's a start okay. date, February 1. I guess I guess the question, I, and, it's, and I'm not asking the, the right question here, from the time the headhunters contacted you until February of 1996 was approximately how long? It was at least three and a half months, I'd say. Wow, that's know. just... That's that's just I just think that's a, an extraordinary, remarkable amount of time to. Well, they were interviewing other people, too, especially when Amtrak needed somebody in that position, because the position was what? It was pres it was actually chief executive officer of Amtrak Inner City. OK, so you were never vice president. OK, so. So when you took me to lunch in July of 1996, you were chief, you were president of Amtrak Inner City. President, because I was hired as chief executive officer, but, uh, and, and George Warrington, who was head of Northeast Corridor, he was chief executive Correct. officer of NEC. Gil Mallory, right. of Amtrak West, was chief executive of, of Amtrak West. They advertised the position as chief executive officer of Amtrak Inner City, and that's the job I accepted. About okay. about a month after being on the job, we were in a president's meeting in Tom Down's office. And he says, say, you know what? I'm kind of like getting some you know, feedback from the board where they're saying, this makes no sense to have four chief executive officers of Amtrak. Would you guys be you know, resistant to having your titles changed to president? And Honestly, title didn't mean crap to me. I didn't care. We had a job to do. So, you know, I kind of like almost use the line, well, you know, you call me anything you want, just not late for dinner, that kind of a thing. Right. 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 And, uh, you know, Gil and George, they were fine with that too to say, yeah, shoot, you know, we can do that. We just have to order new business cards. That's all. So we became presidents of the business units. So that's right. when I became, that's why I was president of Amtrak Inner City when we had our lunch together. And so the only person you reported to was Thomas Downs. Tom Downs. Okay. And yeah. he reported to the board. Right. But you you maintain residency and, and office in Chicago as right. president of Amtrak Intercity. Yeah. Gil Mallory had two offices. One was in LA, one was in Oakland. And George Warrington's office was Philadelphia. Philadelphia. I remember. Yes. Right. Uh, I just think it's remarkable. Not, uh, 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 I'm not privy to know, but you would be somebody who achieved your levels of rarefied air in the railroad industry would know the answer to this. I would, I would think in the latter half of the 20th century, it would have been a very unusual event to be hired into the presidency of a railroad. Well, Union Pacific did it when they brought in Walsh. Okay. But you did know, he? I I know nothing. Did he come from another railroad? Did he? No, he didn't he just from, come off the street. No, he came from um, got the outfit that makes the engines for the uh, highway tr trucks. Um, Cummings, DC? Cummings, yeah. yeah Mike Walt. He came right. from Cummings. Uh, Burlington Northern hired Richard Bressler from Atlantic Richfield. They hired Walter Drexel from Atlantic Richfield into the present spots. They hired Darius, let's see, Darius, or oh, Jerry Grinstein came from Western Airlines to run the railroad. You know, well, so see, you, yeah. you knew, you knew the answer to that. Okay, so what happened to you was not uncommon with what was going on in the railroad industry at that time. Not, not okay. to me, not to me. Although I, I, it depends on what property you're talking about. Some properties, you die before you bring in an outsider to be president. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's that's the railroad background that I come from. It's like but see, Burlington Northern was different. Burlington Northern was a renegade railroad until Jerry Grinstein came. Then things kind of got settled down, you know. And I talk about that in the book also. Okay. All right. So, uh, okay. Uh, 
you know there let, let me let me move forward and ask you an aside question that number one you may not know the answer to and number two uh happened way after your time but i would love to for, for somebody from my uh position here never understanding what happened what happened to amtrak's mail baggage and express and why do we not have any of it today did there's the question. Did your tenure and your thoughts prove that it really wasn't profitable and we needed to go another direction? No. Oh, okay. At the time then I left, we were building it up. And I think it may be better to go into the presentation that I have for you. Yes, uh, please. The Texas Eagle Way. Through the heart of the nation, the traveling sensation. Get your reservation today.